Good morning. This craft lecture is called Blundering About in Folklore and What Was Found There. I must, I'm afraid, talk about myself throughout. Sorry, <laughs> it's necessary. <laughs> Summer 1952. I was having the normal nervous breakdown of a confused young actor who just didn't see commercial stardom in his future and didn't know what the purpose of his life could possibly be besides more summer stock. I went to a town in Appalachia to spend the summer like Hans Kastorp on a magic mountain. Mine was Boone, North Carolina, a popular place now more like Woodstock than anything else. But then, still the small town that had been even more remote a generation before. I had lived my second, third, and fourth year of my life in a large white house on a hill in the center of town and my father's relations all gathered together to escape the ravages of the depression of the early 1930s. Now, I had come back in 1952. I was told by my favorite cousin, Margaret Coffey, who ran the house, to stop sitting on the porch brooding and do something. There was a college in Boone, why not take a course? I did, and my blundering about in folklore began, leading me directly into the life I have since lived. I saw in a catalog a course marked Old English and Scottish Ballads. I registered and showed up. A small, quiet, slightly, I thought, and was to discover enormously impish man, in middle age, was the professor. His name was Cratus Williams, C-R-A-T-I-S, Williams. And he had worked his way down from the even more remote mountains of Kentucky when he was very young. First to get through a high school, then to work his way through a college, then to begin working his way through graduate school by teaching courses like this one at small colleges like this one, which he never left, and which in time he graced as an outstanding teacher and for a time led as chancellor. Appalachian State University is now a large and thriving American school. He became perhaps the first, or perhaps the most truly, respected scholar of Appalachia first because he was to its former wildness born and second because after getting a PhD at NYU of all places and accumulating wonderful notes in Boone for years an administration building in which they were stored burned down thus destroying the magnum opus he'd spent his life preparing to write but preserving his reputation from the inevitable tarnishing many such academic life works inevitably receive. <laughs> we began the course in a scholarly manner with the child collection, Old English and Scottish popular ballads, definitive descendant of Percy's relics, and so on, and a description of how the serious study of folklore proceeds. Stiff Thompson and folk motifs in six million volumes and all of that. But soon, he was doing something else. He was showing us what folklore was, not with academic analysis or show-off erudition, but with the Aeolian harp this little man could magically become. Because he knew, had heard sung in childhood, the ballads of England, Scotland, Scandinavia, and elsewhere in Kentucky and North Carolina, and he knew where they were still being sung, in what versions. He could tell us not only how old a child ballad was in the United States, but where and in what version he had heard it, and how he himself dealt with it. He was, of course, an artist disguised as a professor, but a happy one who loved teaching and students, intent on being able to say, as he did as a young man beginning to teach, I know we will have a good school. Ballads, this little man told us, were stories before songs, starkly delivered, unvarnished by minstrelsy. 
This was news to me at that time, and still a lover of Burl Ives and Richard Dyer Bennett and company. But Kratos said that while that was all very well, the art of the minstrel clouded the deeper drama of a great ballad. Real ballad singers, and he was one, not only didn't sing beautifully, they sang badly, on purpose, never training their voices, sternly avoiding anything that sounded like music, beauty, or God save us culture. A ballad was a stripped down essential of life, sung over and over for thousands of years in country after country, changing, but not much, as the different balladeers dealt with them. It was my first taste of the vast world of illiterate magnificence. I will give you my version of a small, quiet, gentle, modest, but impish and substantial Cratus Williams singing as he interpreted what I, as I remember, he considered the best of the ballads. Edward. The tune is very simple, but I have to, but it's elusive. I have to. How come that blood on your coat, my son? Oh, my son, tell me. It is the blood of my good greyhound that led the chase for me, me, me. That led the chase for me. Well, the blood of a hound was never so red. Oh, my son, tell me. It is the blood of my fine roan horse that led the race for me, me, me. That led the race for me. The blood of a horse was never so thick. Oh, my son, tell me. It is the blood of my own father dear. What shared his life with thee, thee, thee? What shared his life with thee? What did you fall out about? Oh, my son, tell me. He cut down my little apple bush that would have made a tree, tree, tree. That would have made a tree. What will you do now? Oh, my son, tell me. I'll set my foot in a bottomless boat and roam far over the sea, sea, sea. And roam far over the sea. Oh, what will you leave to your child and your wife? Oh, my son, tell me. The sorrow and strife all of their life is what they get from me, me, me is what they get from me. And what will you leave to your mother so dear? Oh, my son, tell me. A fire of coals to burn out her tongue. And the curses of hell from me, me, me. And the curses of hell from me. Oh, when will you come back again? Oh, my son, tell me. When the sun and moon set in the sycamore tree, and that will never be, 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 and that will never be. <laughs> well, when he finished, we sat back in our chairs. Wait a minute, we said. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> He told us that even balladeers shrank from this original version. They waffled, making the victim a sweetheart or a sibling, but not a father, while Edward was, in fact, an Oedipus ballad. All right, we said, he didn't kill an animal, it was his father, but what was that stuff about the bottomless boat and the sycamore tree, and why, for God's sakes, was he mad at his mother? <laughs> In these strict days of PC, that question looms even larger. Kratos said, this is what you might call ancient finesse. You can't see the sun and moon at once in a sycamore tree. A bottomless boat will sink. The man's life is over, and he knows he will commit suicide. And he also knows his mother egged him on to kill his father. Wormed him and wormed him till he'd done it in Appalachia. But that is never directly said. It is inside a dramatic performance and left for you to perceive according to your experience of the basics 
of family realities or dysfunction, as we euphemistically call them today. So that's what we had, love and death, stark and simple, in eight stanzas, an oppressive father, a manipulative mother, and a homicidal, suicidal son. Essentials stripped bare. <laughs> Moreover, it is, as a work of art, begun at the last possible structural moment, doing what it does with not one excess word, and ending with nothing left possibly to relate. I said to myself, Jesus Christ, Almighty God, not as an oath, but as the only reaction which seemed to me strong enough. It turned out, in a strange way, to be very prophetic. For Kratos then turned to the other side of the ballads, in the ballad world, the comic ballads. Um, they are very funny. Uh, you know them, the, the farmer and the devil, the, the devil and the farmer's wife, and so on and so forth. But they still uh, possess great reality. They deal with the, even in fun, with the cruelty of men, the treachery of women, and the rage and rebellion of children, as the other ballad did. Uh, a kind of reality that I had uh, not yet quite experienced in literature, in college, and so on. I skip now to the summer of 1964 and another looming nervous breakdown. This time on the back porch at Yaddo, the art colony at Saratoga Springs. I had published a first novel set in Appalachia, but not about folklore. A literary life begun, I proceeded to make the big mistakes that sometimes follow realized goals. In this case, marriage and divorce, but with them a wonderful baby I was unhappily separated from. In time, that worked out, and the baby became a remarkable woman I love and respect. Her name is Laura Linney, a successful actress. I'm very proud of her. You can go to the movies and see her as the wife in the Truman story, but that's folklore of a different kind. <laughs> there are still a lot of books on the back porch of Yaddo, from the personal collection of Spencer and Katrina Trask, its founders. I idly picked one up in 1964. It was called Italian Popular Tales by Thomas Crane, published in 1885 in Boston. It was a collection of Southern Italian folklore, gathered by this American author from the work of a Professor Petrie, who grew up in Sardinia. I imagine rather like Kratos in Kentucky. Like much written down raw folklore, it was repetitious, boring, and fragile losing in the transcription to writing its verbal life. Ho-hum, I was bored. But then, suddenly, the sun came out and I was enchanted, as I still am, by something ancient but to me brand new. My Jesus Christ Almighty God reaction eight years before reflected a Southerner's close, if sometimes difficult, relationship with the Bible. Here before me were folklore stories about Jesus and St. Peter, never, ever, believe me, appearing in anything blessed by the fathers of the church. They presented pretty much the same idea, quickly recognizable in their raw state as comic tales, in which the Lord performs a miracle. St. Peter then tries, a faithful and loving, but slightly envious chief apostle, to duplicate it and, of course, screws absolutely everything up. Well, aside from its bureaucratic truthfulness and penetrating insight into the nature of true believers, the tales restored to the life of Jesus what I have always found crucially missing, a sense of humor. Life, as I know it anyway, is intolerable without laughter. And here laughter definitely was, bursting out of me as I read slightly weird fragments about a sorcerer and his apprentice. Example, Jesus, St. Peter, and his, apostles, and his apostles are going down the road one day when a man runs up all out of breath. Says to Jesus he's in terrible shape because his beloved father is dying. What should he do? Jesus thinks a minute and says, Put him in your bread oven and cook him. 
St. Peter gasps. But the man goes and does just that, and sure enough, the dying father jumps out, fresh as a loaf of bread, and the man runs back to Jesus, praising his holy name. St. Peter thinks, well now, another man comes running up, <laughs> all out of breath. He has to see Jesus. St. Peter says, Jesus is busy. <laughs> you can talk to me. What's the trouble? The man's mother is dying, what should he do? In the oven and cook her. The man does that and he comes running back with a meat cleaver in his hand <laughs> because of course his beloved mother was reduced to a burnt cinder and he's going to anatomize St. Peter who jumps behind the Lord and Jesus smiling fixes everything. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Almighty God in folklore too, it was more than I had ever hoped for. And I filed it away in my heart as we writers do. Eight more years go by. 18, uh, 1972. <laughs> what does that mean, I wonder? 1972, and the breakdown this time <laughs> was left lober pneumonia, Lenox Hill Hospital for a touch and go 18 days. Week afterwards, I remembered twice eight years of folklore past. And for several months thereafter, I sat on the number five Broadway bus and went to the New York Public Library. I had that wonderful institution bring up all the folklore journals in English, beginning with the earliest, which got started in the middle of the 19th century. I was looking for those buried stories about Jesus and St. Peter, and of course, I found many other equal marvels, unrelated to anything so it seemed. But in that keeping the faith manner, writers can never quite explain to skeptics. I knew I would use everything somehow when all this came together one fine day, never mind when, and never mind the seeming terrible waste of time and logical effort. I knew I would use Prince Unexpected, King Sleep, Immortal Boney, and the boy who could not shudder. I spent heedless days pondering sayings like, kill the snake, but don't break your stick. No nose and a bad cold. <laughs> when the horse falls in love with his grass, he dies of hunger. And life to the lamb is death to the wolf. I explored the story of the counterfeit dream, of the ghost doomed to do impossible things when all he wanted was the ordinary. I wondered about modern symbolism and tales of human sacrifices buried under new buildings, thinking about the skyscrapers on 6th Avenue in New York, the mole giving up its eyes for a slim tail, how to be able to talk to different animals, your own star, which goes out when you die. And remember not to jump too high under a low ceiling. I followed the 16 stations of the folk hero. He is an infant born out of wedlock, mother a princess at home, father a god traveling, tokens of future greatness which lead to his banishment from his home, suckled by wild beasts, brought up by them or by a childless shepherd, grows up passionate and violent in disposition, seeks service in foreign lands, attacks and slays monsters, attains supernatural knowledge by eating a magic fish, returns home, leaves, returns again, overcomes his enemies, frees his mother from slavery and takes the throne of his dead father, founds cities, accused of incest, kills his younger brother, injures an inferior who takes revenge upon him or his children, dies young in some extraordinary manner, a novel in every step. Greek vampires with bloody teeth and strange, unspecific sexual practices, and I think maybe the Turkish origin of Byron's line of what you do in Asia, you sink yourself in sherbet and sodomy. A king, unconsoled in mourning for the death of his child, ordering a thousand men to beat the sea with golden chains. 
centuries of parrot jokes. <laughs> then suddenly alert, I find myself closer to the Jesus stories in the whole wacky world of New Testament Apocrypha with its outlandish unknown journeys of Jesus justly cast out by the fathers of the church, but also the comic life and heart-rending death stories of Joseph, the earthly father with the impossible son, which should have stayed. Simon Peter appears in a deadly contest with Simon Magus, the sinister magician in the first Faust, Peter's other self, who would become a disciple. If Simon Peter would just let him in on the magic tricks Jesus used, in raising the dead, walking on water, and changing loaves into fishes. Obviously magic. Thrown out by the indignant Simon Peter, Simon Magus goes to Rome. He becomes beloved by Nero and finally at high noon faces the aged captive Saint Peter in a battle of magic ordered by Nero on the steps of the capital in Rome to see which magician has the greatest powers. Simon Magus creates instant palaces which engulf St. Peter with luxuries never dreamed of, including a beautiful young girl whose head falls off when St. Peter, in spite of himself, says hello. St. <laughs> Peter calling this magic and magic trivial nonsense, like the travesties of Jesus he exposed before he was arrested. And here, folklore intersected with such um, fathers and ancients of the church is Aragon writing against Celsus, Hippolytus swearing the absurd is truth, even Suetonius describing Nero. And the folk Bible with its down-to-earth common sense, suggesting that St. Peter got to Rome in the first place because St. Paul was jealous. Since St. Peter was the first apostle and he came later and St. Peter never let St. Paul forget it. You never saw him, said St. Peter. I did, driving St. Paul crazy. <laughs> So St. Paul gets rid of him by sending St. Peter to Rome to fight evil magicians who claim Christian powers. Valentine, the melon heretic. His magic is called a pro-arch, which is manifested in Rome as the gourd, in which exists a power he calls utter emptiness. That sound familiar? <laughs> St. Peter hears that Valentine serves the faithful pieces of fruit called the great cucumber, and with that another larger something called the essential melon. It contains a drug. We know now from fermented wheat and grain that the ancients used, uh, like acid, to blow their minds, which they did at the Oracle of Delphi and the Eleusian Mysteries, uh, attended by Socrates, among other people. This drug gets everybody drunk, everybody forgets Jesus, and they have orgies. That sound familiar, certainly. St. <laughs> Peter gets Valentine to talk at length about the gourd and utter emptiness, the great cucumber within the essential melon, and how they all fit into the pro-arch, <laughs> while he pretends to listen. Everybody sees how Valentine likes to mock other people's religion as he preaches his own, and how much he loves the sound of his own voice. They feel used and get rid of him. Others like Prince Crocodile, the Egyptian marsh man who seduces wives, and Absetheus the Libyan who trains birds to sit in trees and sing, Absetheus is a god. <laughs> Saint Peter tells the wives they aren't the only one Prince Crocodile goes to bed with and gets some parrots from Africa to sing, Absetheus is a horse's ass. <laughs> and that takes care of them. But Simon Magus is more difficult. Did you know? That in folklore, St. Peter has a lame daughter. Her name is Petronella. And St. Peter wonders why it is Jesus never cures her when he could so easily. Well, on the steps of Rome before Nero, Simon Magus wraps himself in a blue cloak and vanishes to be seen in a moment flying over Rome. A better magician than Jesus, says Nero. St. Peter, infuriated, loses his temper and by the magic he possesses in the name of Jesus Christ, he calls for Simon Magus to fall and die. Simon Magus falls, smashing his body to pieces on the steps of Rome, but then appearing beside his own body, which, when he removes the blue cloak, discovers the broken body of St. Peter's lame daughter, Jesus would never cure, who then also vanishes. Before Nero awards the prize to Simon Magus, he asks St. Peter, what was the real magic of Jesus? And St. Peter says simply how he walked, and how he talked, and how he stood up, and sat over there, and how everybody loved him. 
Nero doesn't understand this at all and has St. Peter crucified upside down. <laughs> well, by this time your blundering folklorist is dizzy with the extent of it all. It is like a huge century-wide folklore web with amazing data but so much I can't handle it. I finally just passed out. Vanquished by overkill, admitting there are more connections in heaven, earth, and folklore than dreamt of in my philosophy. I did, however, keep a notebook and put in it the tales of Immortal Boney and the boy who could not shudder, and with them this whole enchanting Bible of the folk, as it is called by scholars and folklorists who know it. It is the lore, mostly comic, but not always, of people who couldn't read, who led hard lives. So what the priests told them had to make down-home practical sense, like the life they knew, and we all lead. So Joseph is 89 when he meets Mary, who is 14, and that's the way that happened, since virgins just don't have babies, not by virile husbands anyway. And in many stories, especially in southern Italy, St. Peter and Jesus are bound together not as the fount and founder of Christianity, but as a mysterious God in the person of a young man, given to laughter and jokes, with his eternally loving, eternally uncomprehending faithful servant. Behind every truth St. Peter arrives at about his Lord, and by extension sends down the centuries to us, there is always some terrific misunderstanding. <laughs> Eight more years go by. I have never comprehended the definitely unmagical number eight's role in this saga, but everything did seem to be divided by it. A mystery forever, inconsequential and healthy, happily never to be understood. I was learning from the folk what not to try to understand. During the next eight years then, I slowly put together a sort of novel using the folklore. It was very hard to do because if you expound on folklore, it tends to get bloated with bogus profundity. Uh, like Bad Grimm or Anderson. And yet if you try to keep it very simple, it is so fragile it falls apart and lacks human reality. So I labored, but with good advice from Jack Shoemaker at North Point Press and my friend Reynolds Price, who really understood what I was trying to do. A novel, Jesus Tales, came out in 1980. It did all right, did fine. Jesus not being diminished, the book sticking to the elements of basic folklore that Cratus Williams had embodied for me in 1952. I like my three novels and respect the writing of them, but I'm really a playwright, and I have since dramatized each of these books. In doing so to Jesus' tales, I thought, as a folk myself, I would send Jesus and St. Peter on a walk around the world, passing through Appalachia and Cratus William's country. <laughs> what the Lord was looking for, who and what he and St. Peter found in the Smoky Mountains, makes up a short play why the Lord come to Sand Mountain, which I'll read when I do my reading here tomorrow night. Those of you who are interested can see how all this blundering through folklore finally got on stage, and the play has been done quite a bit and works well. Not long ago, a friend in North Carolina told me that Cratus Williams had once written something about my first book. She sent it to me, a long ago review in a small journal I treasure it above all others. Mr. Williams died before I was able to tell him how much I owe him. Because it wasn't just folklore this gentle and wise man gave to me. It was a foundation for my own sensibility I had not yet discovered. It took me a long time to know what he was really showing me. But later, whether working from very different places, the Bible of the folk or plays about Lord Byron, Frederick the Great, or Hermann Goering, in utterly different Appalachian works, and in plays taken from my family life, love life, life in the army, life in New York, and so on, I have since that man's singing of that ballad always known what my bearings were. I have not always been able to find them, but thanks to him, I have always known they were there. Thank you.